As many of you may know already, Typical Colors 2 is the Roblox counterpart to Team Fortress 2. Released on Roblox near the end of 2015, the developers proposed Typical Colors as a reimagined TF2, with numerous improvements and actual updates. And Typical Colors does deliver on that part. Uh, kinda. You see, it brings in many changes for sure, fundamental differences to how the game even works, rebalancing certain classes, changing weapons, etc. And some of these changes are good, but others are a bit questionable. So today I'll be going over every weapon Typical Colors has changed and talking about whether I think they were deserved, with today's spotlight being the Scout, or Flanker. Before we start, I do have a couple rules. First off, some weapons in Typical Colors are renamed and have their stats modified, but exist for a similar purpose to a TF2 weapon, so I might get a comparison wrong. Secondly, I will be skipping over some weapons that have very minor changes to them, but, you know, they don't really change the weapon that much. And finally, because random crits and random bullet spread don't exist in typical colors, I won't be talking about them. Alright, let's get into it. The first weapon on the list is the shortstop, under the same name in typical colors. The weapon in TF2 is surprisingly complicated. The stat card is an injustice to just how many stats this weapon actually has. It fires 40% faster, deals double damage per pellet, reloads its entire clip at once, and is 40% more accurate. However, you only have 4 shots in a clip, each shot shoots only 4 pellets, you take more knockback force, and this weapon does not have damage ramp up. There's also the funny but useless shove mechanic. Compare all of what I just said to the actual stat card. Valve Y. In typical colors, it shares a similar firing speed, 4 shots per clip, entire clip reloading, and accuracy. Outside of that though, the weapon has been changed a lot. It replaces the shove mechanic with a 50% rechargeable rechargeables. However, you deal 20% less damage, and instead of entirely removing damage ramp up, it's only 33% less. Even though TC2's version does shoot more or less damaging pellets, its base damage is the same as in TF2. 48. You know, looking at the stats more, the only true difference is that the shove mechanic was replaced with a 50% refill on all rechargeables. It's a situational upside if you're running mad milk, sodas, or a baseball bat. A nice upside referencing the milkman set, but the overall effectiveness of the shortstop doesn't change much. Next up on the list is the Soda Popper, under the same name in typical colors. In TF2, we have a 50% faster firing speed, a 25% faster reload speed, and only 2 shots in the clip. There's a special feature called Hype that requires 350 damage from any weapon to charge, and gives 5 mid-air jumps upon activation. In typical colors, we get a couple changes. The height feature needs 400 damage to charge, but grants an additional faster reload speed and full air control while active. However, it removes the 25% faster reload speed and adds a questionable no double jump penalty. The soda popper wasn't exactly overpowered or extremely annoying to fight against. At most, the height function was a bit infuriating, but that took risk to charge up. The lack of a double jump isn't the end of the world, but why it was needed is anyone's guess. Moving on, we have the Babyface's Blaster, under the same name in typical colors. In TF2, the BFB has 4 shots in a clip and brings you down to 120% movement speed, 10% slower than his normal 133%. However, with 100 damage, you can bring your speed up to 173%. You lose this boost quickly though, as double jumping removes 75% boost, and 25 damage is all it takes to bring you back to zero. In TC2, the BFB has 6 shots and brings you down to 106% movement speed, or 20% slower. You still need to deal 100 damage to get full boost, but it also takes 100 damage to bring you back down, and you can freely double jump. Your shots are also 40% more accurate, but deal 30% less damage, bringing your base damage down to 42. You start out slower, but boost ends up being much harder to lose. I feel like this leans into the territory of the shortstop. Both weapons deal less damage, but you're more comfortable at mid to long range. It's a decent change that makes it so that getting to fights is harder, but your mobility after that is way better. And you also want to treat it a bit like the shortstop. Now we have the Backscatter, renamed the Perceptionist in typical colors. In TF2, the Backscatter deals mini crits from behind, allowing you to one-shot light classes. However, you have 4 shots in the clip and your shots are 20% less accurate, making your mid-range matchups much worse. In TC2, the Perceptionist is much simpler. You still deal mini crits from behind, but now all those penalties have been replaced with 10% less pellets and 20% slower reload speed. 10% less pellets mean you have 9 in a shot, but you still deal enough damage to one-shot light classes. I'd say the changes in TC2 are well thought out. It encourages flanking, but it doesn't ruin your normal combat capabilities like in TF2. You gotta take longer breaks in between fights to reload, and you deal slightly less damage up front, but you don't need to be in hugging distance to deal damage. Now here's where that second rule comes into play. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol doesn't exist within TC2, but there's a very similar pistol in the form of the Concealed Carry. However, the two distribute healing differently, which is something to keep in mind. In TF2, the Pocket Pistol fires 50% faster and gives you 3 health on hit. However, you only have 9 shots. 
In TC2, the concealed carry fires 20% faster, and rather than giving health on hit, it gives you 63 overheal. However, it brings your damage down to 10, and you cannot get overheal from medics. You deal 135 damage in a clip with the pocket pistol and 120 with the concealed carry, and you can get your damage out faster with the pocket pistol. The health on kill focuses the concealed carry into a finisher with great rewards, whereas the pocket pistol was more general. The two weapons are actually quite different, and the overheal can be busted at times. An interesting change that I personally quite like. To end off the secondaries, we have the Flying Guillotine, renamed the 6-point Shuriken in typical color. The Flying Guillotine deals 50 base damage and 40 bleed damage. It recharges in 6 seconds, and this can be reduced to 4.5 with a long-range hit. In TC2, the Shuriken has damage falloff, dealing 56 at point blank but dealing 30 at long range. It also deals 16 bleed damage, recharging in 8 seconds. The Guillotine was definitely a good weapon, but it wasn't exactly overpowered or annoying. Reducing the bleed damage to a minuscule amount and reducing damage with long-range hit nerfs the weapons, and I don't think it was really needed. On to the melees, a couple of the stock weapons in TC2 have stats added to them to buff them, which kind of ruins the point of it being stock, but oh well. The bat has only one difference, and that's that it deals crits to targets under 25% health. The main draw is to quickly finish a target if you run out of scattergun ammo or can't afford to fire another shot, which I mean is alright, a situationally useful upside, although it doesn't really feel like stock anymore. Now on to the Sandman, under the same name in typical colors. The Sandman in TF2 shoots a baseball that inflicts a slowing effect at the cost of minus 15 health. The main problem with the Sandman in TF2 was that the slowing effect not only was easy to avoid, but was also too minimal for such a massive health penalty. However, the Sandman in TC2 replaces the minus 15 health with a minus 15% damage, which is an actually good trade-off and raises the viability of the Sandman tenfold. Getting slowed is still annoying, but it's a good change that actually makes the Sandman usable. Also, the ball now deals 40 damage, making it an actually decent way to approach a fight and deal a decent chunk of damage while also slowing the enemy down. Moving on, we have the Candy Cane, under the same name in typical colors. In TF2, it drops a small health pack on kill, but it has a 25% explosive vulnerability. This makes any hit from a demo or soldier devastating, and because it's tough to dodge, this ends up being an extremely punishing weapon for less experienced scouts. In typical colors, it still drops small health packs, and it adds the upsides of dealing mini crits to targets below 25% health, but it replaces the vulnerability with two stats. One, you drop a small health pack on death, and two, you have 40% less primary and secondary ammo. The first downside rarely ever impacts you directly, and the second downside isn't a huge deal on your scattergun since you already have quite a bit of reserve ammo, so it's only really impacting the pistols. The downsides aren't that big, but I think that's alright, so this is a pretty decent change to the candy cane. Then we have the Boston Basher, renamed the Brooklyn Basher in typical colors, cause the flanker is from New York. In TF2, it's a very straightforward weapon. Land a hit, you deal bleed for 5 seconds. Miss a hit, you deal the damage and bleed to yourself. Idiot. In TC2, it still deals bleed for 5 seconds upon hit, but you also deal 20% more damage. On the downside, you swing 20% slower and missing causes you to hit yourself, although you don't take any bleed. The Boston Basher's main problem in TF2 was that your scattergun just outputs more damage and that hit reg was janky. That's been fixed in typical colors, so at least it's more reliable, but the niche of a damaging melee for scout is still kinda pointless. At least you can still build uber and it works well right as a last effort swing. Now onto the sun on a stick, cleverly renamed the grill scout in typical colors. In TF2, you deal critical hits to burning players and you have a 25% fire damage resistance while it's deployed, at the con of dealing 25% less damage. The coordination with a power to get use out of this weapon over something you can already do better with a scattergun makes this weapon very underwhelming. In TC2, you deal mini crits to burning players, but you can also hit an enemy to set them on fire. However, you can remove debuffs from teammates with this weapon, which can seem pretty handy, albeit situational. On the downside, you swing 60% slower, bringing your swing speed down to the Kukri's default swing speed, 0.8 seconds. It's definitely better than the SOAS in TF2, but it's lacking a certain something. I guess as a last resort, you can swing this at an escaping enemy or right before you die, but starting a fight with this is an awful choice. And I'm gonna say this right here and now, it feels even more annoying to get set ablaze by this than by a pyro's weapon. The utility of removing debuffs is situational, but it works. Now we're jumping into the Atomizer, under the same name in typical colors. In TF2, the Atomizer has a triple jump mechanic while the weapon is deployed, as well as the ability to mini-crit enemies while airborne. However, you deal 15% less damage and the weapon deploys 50% slower. In TC2, you still have the third jump. However, the weapon deploys 25% faster, deals 10% less damage, and fires 15% slower. They got rid of the mini crits, and there's also the hidden attribute of dealing 10 damage to the wearer per triple jump. Frankly, the removal of the mini crit stat was fine, and less damage and slower swing speed aren't things to cry about, but the minus 10 health on triple jump confuses me. Nobody complained about the atomizer, so why that nerf was needed is beyond me. 
And finally, ending out Scout's weapons is the Rap Assassin, under the same name in typical colors. The Rap Assassin shoots out a 12 damage ornament that deals 5 seconds of bleed damage. There's a slight blast radius that gives additional damage, but honestly, who cares about that? The ball recharges 25% faster than the Sandman, or 7.5 seconds, but the bat deals 65% less damage. There's also an unlisted stat that allows the ornament to get guaranteed crits if it's been in the air for about a second. In typical colors, the bauble has a base damage of 40, and the bleed duration has reverse fall off, lasting longer the further away you land a shot. This weapon got some pretty good changes, and those are the increased bauble damage and the reverse fall off bleed mechanic. You deal minuscule amounts of bleed if you're at close range, but you get rewarded for landing shots from a distance, which I like. Well, guess that's over. Some of the changes were good, some were a bit questionable, but don't worry, it gets worse when we go along. And holy Biakarin, that's a lot of weapons, way more than I expected. I know I skipped over some weapons like the Bloxy Cola and Wooden Sword, I already explained that their changes are way too minimal. And regarding the Lupara DB, I'm not sure what to do with it since it feels different, but I'm not exactly sure where. And that's pretty much it. If you disagree with anything, let me know in the comments. That's all I have for you guys. Adios.